So we are back. I uh, wanted to thank you for just being patient thus far. For those of you that are interested in a sexual harassment seminar, I just kind of wanted to add in, uh, what is the telephone number, again, of KCAL Insurance? Emery, do you mind giving that? Yes, our general number is 626-333-1111. Very easy to remember. And Emery, uh, being that it's a sexual harassment lawsuit and a sexual harassment essentially type of lecture, how does someone get in touch with you so that they can be able to sit down and stare at you as you talk about the sexual harassment course as well as uh, sexual harassment insurance for purposes of the business? Yes, my direct line is 626-369-8801. Well, we left off with uh, who is liable for sexual harassment, and sexual harassment definitely is an issue, and, and what I left off with, which really wasn't to cause any fear, actually it was to cause fear, because people don't take, particularly managers, don't take sexual harassment very seriously, but you know, the funny thing is this, the courts before used to get very mad at plaintiff's counsel that used to sue managers, because the courts knew what was going on. Judges knew that plaintiff's counsel were suing managers for the express purpose of creating, essentially strong-arming a manager or an employer to settle a case. Or to even have a manager turn around and say, if you dismiss me from the lawsuit, I will say whatever you want. Courts used to get really mad at that. But you know, I think over the last 15 or 20 years, courts have become more lenient as it relates to pleading. And the funny thing is, all the courts have become more lenient as it relates to pleading for parties, they've become more strict in terms of what needs to be said to get punitive damages. So plaintiff's counsel now have become more open to suing more people just because or as a guess. But what they haven't uh, uh, done is more and more plaintiff's counsel now are saying, you know what, we're not going to be so loosey-goosey. We're not going to be so loose about what we say. We are going to make the complaint so bad that it is no different than a pornographic novel so that, so that we can be able to get past the early stage of a case and be able to litigate the case and hopefully be able to get punitive damages. Now, there's another issue that we're going to talk about later, but... In California, as long as the employee is able to, even a dollar, is able to win even a dollar, they are allowed to get attorney fees and costs from the other side, which is the employer, and if the manager is liable, also from the manager. So let me give you an example of a case that I did. So there's kind of this feeling that Paul Chang doesn't lose cases, and frankly, I'd like to think so. But there is one case in which I was brought in after trial, after trial, and uh, essentially the attorney's fees were $600,000, $600,000. And when the client came in to me, he said, I just lost the trial and I would like to reduce my attorney fees. I said, what's the damages? He said, $50,000. I said, $50,000 and he wants $600,000, no problem. There is no judge crazy enough to give $600,000. We're going to give $100,000, and we're going to say that's reasonable. I walked into court, and the judge reduced the fees, reduced the fees about $270,000. My client almost fainted, and so did I. And I told the judge, I said, Your Honor, I understand your position, but I want you to know that you need to be more reasonable. Now, why was I brave enough to say that? Because I thought that the judge had lost her mind. And the judge said to me, counsel, I think before you say another word, you need to understand, I've only given half of what they've asked for. And if you don't leave, I'm not going to rule in any way for you at all. And I'm going to reverse my tentative and give them $600,000. That is how frightening attorney fees and costs could be. And you as a manager may be liable for that. Because at the end of the case, you know what's going to happen. The joint tort feasors, which are the two people that are liable, both the employer and the manager, do you think that as an employer and it's the manager's fault that the employer is going to let that go? No. The employer is going to say, manager, 
You are the reason that I got sued. You decided to not commit something that was normal, which was delivering a pizza and accidentally getting into a car accident. Essentially, what you did was no different than driving drunk and hitting somebody on the street. You should be solely responsible, not me. Now, the difference now between an employer and a manager, you would think, is who has more money? The employer does. So when the employer hires the attorney to go after the manager, the manager is now left in a situation where they must declare bankruptcy or they must defend a second lawsuit. So with that being said, I think I've said enough to be able to communicate that a manager is also liable, but that as a joint tort feeser that many times defendants go after each other and the manager is at a very huge disadvantage as it relates to the sexual harassment lawsuit. And if you want to go up in this world, you got to get sued less. You know, I'm in a position where attorneys get sued all the time and where attorneys sue all the time, and we're very comfortable with that, but most people aren't. And unfortunately, it'd be very difficult as an employer to accept somebody that has essentially a sexual harassment background. But, you know, since we were talking about EPLI, I, you know, I'm just kind of curious. I, I, I heard about this recently, but are there like director, board of directors insurance or CEO insurance or anything like that? I mean, are there such things out there? I mean, if there aren't, there aren't. Yes. Um, EPL insurance has the DNO, the director and officer insurance that you can choose to include or exclude from your policy. So um, at the initial um, application, you can actually put down whether you want to include the DNO or not have the DNO coverage. Of course, if you wish to include that, there is a separate charge, but it will be on the same policy, of course. So this is kind of interesting because I've known EPLI for a long time. So a lot of people don't. So today may be the first day you hear about EPLI, but I, I just recently heard about this director's insurance. And, you know, um, do you, I mean, who should be considering director's insurance? I mean, does the company buy it? Does the director buy it? I mean, you know, I mean, how does that work? The company will buy it on behalf of the director and the, who are considered directors are the people are able to make important decision on behalf of the company. You know, the funny thing is this, um, it, it's it's much easier I, or, or less, uh, uh, um, uh, probably more funny in Chinese, but I've always said uh, that, you know, uh, who should you be asking, you know, whether it's male or female, who should you be asking about uh, wearing high heels, right? And I think the typical answer is? Female. <laughs> but my answer is both. And, and let me tell you why. I think that at, at our firm, we're kind of at an advantage where... Uh, you know, although I work with a lot of employers, but I also have taken on a lot of employee cases too. And, you know, I, I think it's so important because there are so many firms out there that only work on essentially one type of case where they can't be able to see the other side. And I can be able to say that I've seen both the strengths and the weaknesses of um, just lawsuits and sexual harassment in general. And I would definitely say that having come from an employee standpoint as well as an employer standpoint, from the employee standpoint, I believe that you need to sue as many people as you can. Unfortunately, that happens all the time. You do it to try to create leverage. And you do it because everybody has a little bit of money. I mean, what do you think would be easier? Would it be easier to sue somebody for $100,000 or to settle with 10 people for $10,000? Right. So if you think about it, there is a reason why people do sue more people than they need to. And because of that, again, I want to warn those people that are out there that are middle management or managers in general, that you really should be taking your sexual harassment policy much more seriously because the average manager doesn't realize the exposure that he's in. You may be paid a little bit more than everybody else. Not that much. And you're taking on a huge responsibility, so big that if you decide to move up in the corporate ladder and you are constantly being named in lawsuits, you will never be able to get to the position of CEO. You can't because there is no good company out there that will hire a manager that's constantly getting sued for mismanagement. And frankly, for myself, having represented or, having, or representing companies that are on the stock market, a person's background is very important. I mean, you know, we don't want a person that has committed genocide, right? We don't want a person that's a murderer. Similarly, I don't want a person that's a CEO, a CFO, 
or even upper level management that has committed sexual harassment or is even alleged or named in a lawsuit. So again, with that being said, let's move forward. Personal liability will be imposed on any individual who harasses another person in the workplace so long as you're an employment relationship between the two persons. Whether the harasser was employed in a supervisor or manager capacity to the victim is irrelevant for imposing personal liability on the harasser. Personal liability on the harasser. If your company decides that you have harassed another, they have a choice not to defend you. Now this is very different. We talked about the car accident earlier. What is personal liability? Personal liability basically means that you are personally liable if something occurs. Well, the general rule again is if you were out delivering a pizza for your employer and you got into a car accident, not just a fender bender, but a real car accident, the employer as a general rule, at least partially, would need to protect you. But sexual harassment is different. Sexual harassment basically is that if the employer finds that you have sexually harassed somebody, the employer may be liable, yes, but there is no requirement for them to defend you. And frankly, if I was your employer's attorney, I would tell them not to defend you. It's not worth it because I don't want to be the attorney defending the harasser and the company. I want to distance myself from you as far as I can and... If you have committed sexual harassment, you're a middle management, not middle management, and your management, or you let that harassment occur and it was intentional, I would consider actually suing you. So not only are you being sued by the employee, but the employer is also suing you as well. So it's something for you to consider, again, as a manager, management, and in terms of sexual harassment. Two types of sexual harassment. There are two types of sexual harassment. One is a hostile work environment and two is quid pro quo harassment. The second one is very easy to understand. The first is a little more vague but something that's important for everybody to learn. So what are elements? Uh, elements are what make up the law. Elements are facts. So if you're kind of curious and you don't really, you know, you got nothing else to do and, you know, you're not just bored, but you want to go to sleep, pull this up on, uh, on Google or on the Internet. Casey Jury Instructions. It's C-A-C-I Jury Instructions. And what that is, those are things that we give to the jury before they go into the jury room. Because at the end of the day, the law is made up, it, the components are just facts. That's all they are. Without the facts, there is no law. And without the law, there's no reason to sue. So that's what an element is. It's part of the law that make up what goes into a jury room when the jury's deciding things. So here are the elements. The first element of a hostile work environment is the respondent engaged in harassing conduct directed toward the complainant, and the complainant is the person that alleges that she or he was harassed, or the complainant personally witnessed or perceived harassing conduct, and the harassing conduct took place in his or her immediate environment. So, you know, Emery, I am just so curious. How did you know about this? Because I, 99% of people that I talk to they never know that you don't have to be the object of sexual harassment, that you could just literally be in the room and perceive it. How'd you know that? You mean as a, a third party, if, if it's indirect? Yes, I'm not asking you whether somebody sexually harassed you. What I'm saying is <laughs> whether somebody, uh, uh, how did you know about this second area of law? You know, well, Emery, well, everybody, this is what I want to say. Apart from trying to keep you guys awake, there are some things that are always funnier in my head, but I'm still going to say them. So, Emery, tell me, how did you know that you can just be a witness to sexual harassment but still be a complainant and say, I've been sexually harassed? Uh, you'd be surprised how much you can learn from an attorney because um, for so many years now, we conduct sexual harassment seminars. So, of course, we have other attorneys conduct the lecture, and I learned that from that particular attorney. So basically what Emery is saying is that I wasn't invited to come to a KCAL seminar 
But at the same time, she learned something else from somebody that, you know, frankly, I thought that there was a big kept secret about being just a third party witness. But I'm very glad. And it shows that KCAL Insurance really has some good attorneys out there. With that being said, we shall go out of the funniness in my head and back to the element, which is that you can just be a third party witness. So a person that complains of sexual harassment doesn't have to be the object or or the target of the sexual harassment. They can actually be in the general vicinity and personally witnessed or perceived harassing conduct. And because of that, be a claimant. Now that's the first element. Let's go to the second one. The harassing behavior was because of the complainant's sex or gender. So it's important. So a person can harass somebody else, but then we go to the second element. If it wasn't because of the person's sex or gender, it's not sexual harassment. Give you an example. Oh my God, you're so tall. Somebody says, I'm offended by that. Fine, you're offended by that. Well, let's go to the second element. Was the statement made because of the person's sex or gender? No, it was just because the person's making a statement about being tall. So that's very important is that is it about sex or gender? Third, the conduct was unwelcome and sufficiently severe or pervasive that it has the purpose or effect of altering the condition of the complainant's work environment or prospective environment and and created a hostile, abusive, or offensive work environment. So I actually saw a case. Emery, do you think that a judge would rule that if there was a pat on the butt by one person to another person, pat on the butt, that do you think it's do you think a judge would rule that it is not sexual harassment? I think the judge would rule it's sexual harassment if that pat on the butt was unwelcome. And the thing is this, the judge agreed with you that it was unwelcome, but the judge said that it was not sufficiently severe to change the working environment because it was an isolated incident. See, this is so important because what Emery just said is a very, n- not just very obvious statement, it's a very intelligent statement. The problem is that in sexual harassment, there are nuances in the law that may not be that intelligent, but we have to learn it. And that is, was it sufficiently severe, well, it was unwelcome and sufficiently severe, or pervasive that it has the purpose of altering the working environment, right? Did it alter the work environment? See, this is so important. And uh, uh, when you're making a decision, because you know maybe what's gonna happen is that an employee's gonna come up to you and they're gonna complain. They're gonna say, Joe said to Sarah, you hot girl right? You as a manager, as an owner of the business need to go through the elements of a hostile work environment and quid pro quo that we're talking about. And you have to decide, was it sur- sufficiently severe? Was it unwelcome and sufficiently severe or pervasive that it affected the working environment, that it changed the working environment? Now, as a general rule from attorney standpoint, if somebody says you hot chick to somebody else, probably either got to reprimand or let them go. That's true. We're not going to risk it. But I just want you to know what attorneys are looking for because it's so important. And I want you to know that judges have also ruled that there are cases like that where you would think that there was there was sexual harassment, but the judge said no. Now, the fourth element is created an intimidating, hostile, abusive, or offensive work environment. So is saying you hot chick is patting the butt Does that also create a hostile, abusive, or offensive work environment? That's the fourth element and something that people fight about all the time. The fifth thing, and we've learned this before, we just need to know whether the harasser was a manager, supervisor, or agent, or was it a non-supervisor? I mean, those are things that we have to know, right? Now, again, one of the things that I didn't emphasize, and this is the first time I've emphasized it, is the knew or should have known, is how does the employer knew or should have known? And you know, this is kind of the big deal because if you're a non-supervisor, they're always gonna say that the employer knew or should have known. They're always gonna say that. So unfortunately, some employers have taken the position, if I don't see it and you're a non-supervisor, don't let me see it. 
don't if I don't see it, it didn't happen. If I didn't see it, it didn't happen. Well, that's the problem is that if you take that position, the law isn't new. The law is should have known. So one of the questions is, is, well, what did you do? What is your sexual harassment policy? How do you find out whether your non-supervisors are sexually harassing people? If they say, well, uh, nothing. Or, oh, well, word of mouth. Well, that's new or should have known, right? You didn't know, but you should have known. You didn't take any steps. Frankly, if I'm plaintiff's counsel, I'm going to say, you didn't do anything at all. You didn't do anything at all. And this is an issue where I think a lot of employers fail as it relates to sexual harassment. Now, whether the conduct is severe or pervasive is a fact-specific inquiry requiring review of the totality of the circumstances. Now, basically what this means in a very simple way, it just means you got to take everything into consideration, that's all, right? Totality of the circumstances is just legalese for everything in consideration. That's all it means. But you know what the interesting thing about this is that element six, a reasonable person in the same circumstance as the complainant, a reasonable person would have perceived the environment created as being intimidating, hostile, abusive, or offensive. And so they use what the standard being a reasonable person standard is that if you were in that position, what would you have considered as a reasonable person as intimidating hostile abusive or offensive well that's the problem is that because this is a very vague standard it cuts both ways as a defense counsel you're going to say ladies and gentlemen of the jury no reasonable person would have considered it to be intimidating hostile abusive or offensive a reasonable person would have considered a pat on the butt to be stupid that's just flat out stupid. But the plaintiff's counsel is going to say, ladies and gentlemen, you would be totally unreasonable if you considered a pat on the butt not to be intimidating, hostile, abusive, or offensive. You've got to be smoking something, and it's so good, we all need it here. So because of the fact that the reasonable person standard is a very vague standard, it cuts both ways. So therefore, many cases settle. It's just too, too difficult to actually have an understanding of what a, what a reasonable person would be. Now, here is a scarier thought. Remember when you were in algebra? Emery, you took algebra. Emery yes. took calculus when? When you were three? <laughs> no. Okay, when? High school. High school. See, she's one of the people that took calculus. I don't even know how to spell calculus. So with that being said, when you go from algebra one to algebra two, uh, you know, because I didn't know calculus, is, you know, one of the things they teach you is they say, hey, you know, we taught you something before, but that's not really the truth. Remember that? They, they always like, as you get higher level math and it's kind of like gets really philosophical, they say, you know, we taught you this in algebra one, but it's not necessarily true in algebra two. And everybody's like, well, why'd you teach me that in algebra one? Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. Confusing, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But so in terms of the reasonable person, I just talked about what a reasonable person is, but for sexual harassment, a reasonable person takes on a totally different form. So now we're going to algebra two. So what's the reasonable person for purposes of sexual harassment? It is the perspective of a reasonable person is the victim's position, and it requires consideration of all surrounding circumstances and factors, such as age, gender, work experience, education, life experience. What does that mean when I say that? It means that you can't be able to go in and say, well, I'm Bob, I'm 60 years old, and I'm Caucasian, and I'm retired. There is no way, based on me and my reasonable person standard, that because of that, that person sexually harassed another person. When the victim in this case may be an 18-year-old, uneducated, hasn't gone to college, female, that's alleging she's been sexually harassed. The reasonable person standard also requires you to consider it from that person's vantage point, from the victim's vantage point. So why is this so crazy? Because the reasonable person standard not only cuts both ways, as we learned, but for purposes of sexual harassment, cuts even deeper in a strange way. You must view the case through the victim's eyes, not through your own eyes, because that's unfair. Think about it. 18-year-old claims sexual harassment. 
everybody on the case is 60 years old male. Would it be fair to use the reasonable person standard from a 60 year old male? No. So the standard has to go somewhere. And the standard for purposes of sexual harassment goes to a reasonable person standard in the victim's position. So you got to think about it. How do I feel when I was 18 and female, although I'm a 60 year old male retired guy? Well, that's the difficult thing about sexual harassment, and that's the reason why so many cases settle. So let me give some examples of sexual harassment. Leering, staring, making sexual gestures, displaying sexual suggestive or explicit objects, pictures, cartoons, graffiti, posters, emails, text messages, you know, one of the things that a lot of people do at a company, and I get it, there's always the funny guy. You know what I'm talking about? Y you know the funny guy, right? That funny guy that's always got to send out every sex joke. Why? Maybe he's insecure. Maybe he's not. Who cares? But he's the funny guy. And typically, the funny guy is sending out the sex things that makes everybody laugh. He goes around poking people in the waist, giving people hugs, things like that. Well, the problem is this. Hugs, we get it. Touching, not so good. But what about these cartoons, graffiti, posters, emails, and text messages? I'm telling you, the internet has made everything so small. And think about you as a manager or even an owner posting a message on Facebook that you find is funny. It's sexually funny. Think about that. Those are examples of sexual harassment. Staring is an example of sexual harassment. You know what's unfortunate? So many people don't realize this. And, you know, um, there was a person that came into my law office one time and you know, she was very attractive. And, um, you know, I can understand why people would want to look at her, right? Why, why people would be, would gravitate toward her. And, you know, she said something to me that was totally stunning. She says, when I wake up in the morning, I have to take the time and think about what I wear, whether I should put on makeup, how I do my hair. I was like, Oh yeah, of course you're really pretty. And she said, you know, it's not because I want to look pretty. It's because I have to sit there and figure out whether somebody's going to look at my chest. If I wear lipstick, is someone going to look at my lips? If I wear eyeliner, is someone going to stare at me? If I do my hair, is someone going to make a comment? I wish I could just wear a trash bag. And I thought to myself, God, you know, the average person would look at her and say, you're so beautiful, you could wear anything you want. And here she's hoping to wear a trash bag to go to work. And so it's very sad because, I mean, you've never seen me, but I can be able to tell you that, you know, I don't think anybody would care whether I wore a trash bag or not, or anybody would care whether, you know, whatever it is I wore. I, I haven't been in an experience where people are just literally staring at me. And with that being the case, it's, you know, it was kind of eye-opening for me. And as the longer I've been practicing, the more I realized as an attorney that, there are reasons why people feel hurt, and staring is one of them. You know, it, you know, before I ever had a sexual harassment case, I would laugh at you if you told me that staring was sexual harassment. I mean, then why even go to Vegas? Everybody's staring at each other. Well, you realize that there's a reason why in California sexual harassment cases are litigated, and cases of staring can be a situation where there's sexual harassment. So, Leering, staring, sexual gestures, you know, this is the thing. A lot of people think if it's not written, if it's not heard, it doesn't happen. So what do they do? They take one hand, they make it into a circle, and they take, make another hand, they poke it back and forth, and they say, hey, as long as nobody saw, you know, as lo you know nobody heard it, right, and nobody saw it because I didn't write it down, it's okay. No, that's still sexual harassment. That is. So here's more sexual harassment. Foul or obscene languages, foul or obscene languages, derogatory comments, gender-specific slurs, explicit discussions about sexual activities and behaviors, comments about other people's attributes. So <clears throat> just to let you guys know, so when I was younger, so I'm just going to open myself up a little bit. I don't know if you knew this, Emery. You don't know me that well. Is that I was actually 70 pounds heavier. So I, oh, No, I, don't, I did not yeah, know Yeah, so I was actually really, really big, you know, and, you know, I, I, you know, when I say this, people always think it's funny. Uh, you know, when I used to go to the bathroom, I couldn't see my feet. That's how big I was. I literally was huge. Was that a fat joke? 
No, no, I'm talking about myself. <laughs> I'm talking about myself. I literally couldn't see my feet, and and I was so big that when I was younger, uh, it was I think either junior high or high, oh, it was I think junior high or right before junior high. I actually had a heart attack. I was so fat, and I got skinny because I started playing basketball. I got really tall, and then I got fat again. And I had to lose seventy pounds because if I didn't lose it or more, if I didn't lose it, something bad was really going to happen. You know, one of the nice things is, you know, since we're kind of being very open, one of the sweetest things I think that's ever happened in my life, the person I was dating at the time, which was a long time ago, was very sweet to me because no matter how big I was at the time, she loved me. And um, she's married to somebody else now, and we're still very, very good friends. Um, but I just wanted to open myself up to let you know that people were always constantly making comments about the way I looked. So I was so big that somebody would come up to me on the street and laugh at me. Somebody would say to me, you know, they, they wouldn't just call me the big guy because I was playing, you know, I was still tall, but I was playing basketball. They would just call me the fat guy. And now, Emery, you don't speak Cantonese, right? I do, a little. Uh, oh, okay, a little meaning that you know that if you speak Cantonese, I don't speak Cantonese, they always just straight up just tell you. They just call you the fat guy in, in Cantonese. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, so up. I mean, I was that guy, right, in the room that people, you know, and I don't speak Cantonese, but, you know, obviously I'm that guy that people are like, oh, you don't fit in the door, you don't do this, you know. How, how do you even scratch your back? I mean, you know, can you bend down and touch your toes? And it sounds so sad, but it's true. Now, how do we tie that in into, and this is what I want to say. For people that are listening, it really is the heart that matters. Now, comments about people's attributes. This is so important because we see it all the time. There's always gossip at the office. The bigger the office, the more the gossip. And you know, unfortunately, people are constantly talking about the way other people look at the office. And I want you to know, there are cases where that becomes sexual harassment. So it's so important as a manager or as an owner of a business, you realize that sexual harassment is more than just about sex, right? It's more than just about that. It can also be about the way people look, right? So those are comments about other people's attributes. And, you know, another thing that happens is that people get around the water cooler on Monday. They say, yo, dude, it was so great. I went over to Hollywood and I saw these girls and they were so beautiful. And went out, we totally partied and all this sex and it was great. And, you know, these are problems that occur also with other employees as well. That's also sexual harassment. Unfortunately, right, for, for some of you are listening, you're like, well, I can't believe it. I'm doing it every Monday morning. But unfortunately, it is. Right? Whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, it is. And, you know, one of the words that I think are very concerning to a lot of people, and people use it all the time, is the word bitch. This is very important. And the reason why this is so important and the reason why I'm willing to say this so that all of you can hear me cuss is because of the fact that I hear it so often and people now have taken certain words and they said it's not derogatory, right? It, it's not, I, I'm not using it to talk about women. I'm using it to describe a woman. Does that, I'm using it to describe this uh, employee or, or, or somebody else. It's a character. It, it's not a woman, right? I'm not sexually harassing anybody. Well, look, you can't justify it that way. You got to avoid it. Got to avoid it. Okay. <clears throat> Other things, uh, sexual advances, uh, sexual propositions, I think that's easy. Sexual innuendos, let me tell you, if you're a part of an immigrant, com uh, immigrant company, when I say immigrant company, I mean that you know, you're know you part of a group of people that a lot of people are from overseas, right? For some reason, if it's an immigrant company, everybody likes to have fun, talk about sex. Am I right? Have you seen that? Not at KCAL. Not at KCAL, no. But everywhere else. Do you agree with that? Somewhat, yes. Okay, so I'm obviously overgeneralizing, but the reality is I see that all the time. And, you know, I think that in an immigrant company, and when I say immigrant company, we're all Americans. You put your two feet on the ground, you're an American. But an immigrant company meaning that, you know, for example, if you have a group of people that are together that have a common, uh, just commonality between them, sexual just jokes, right? Or, 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 you know, just talking about sexual things. Those are really fun because they, 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 they allow you to bond over something that you like. Well, unfortunately, that is also sexual harassment. 
one of the things we haven't talked about is the spreading of rumors. Is that sexual harassment? It is. So the person at the office that you consider to be TMZ, as soon as I said that and you feel it's you, believe it or not, it's you. You know, I always say this. There are three people at the office. One out of three is TMZ. Think about the first person. Think about the second person. If they're not TMZ, it's you that's listening to me right now. You have to be very careful. Because if you're the one that's spreading rumors about another person's sexual activities, forget about defamation. Defamation's out the door. Who cares? You may be in a lawsuit for sexual harassment. So you got to be really careful. Okay. Written conduct, suggestive, obscene, propositioning letters, notes, invitations. Obviously, writing. People have begun realizing writing is bad. But you know, the funny thing is that people know not to write it with their hands. But for some reason, if it's on chat or text, people are totally okay with writing sexual things. It's just this weird, strange phenomenon. Forget about the fact that most kids right now can't even do handwriting. I can because I learned. Emery, do you handwrite? Of course I can. Okay, that's a no. <laughs> so in, in terms of um, most people don't write it with their hands, but they definitely email it and type it and, and, and G-chat it and you know uh, text it. So you got to be careful. Uh, displaying pictures and writing, okay? Uh, examples of behavior found to be sexual harassment. You know, you got unwelcome touching, kissing, hugging, grabbing. You know, uh, <clears throat> no, I, I stopped with grabbing. But in 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 terms of the hugging, though, you know, I do want to say that I understand in good working environments that there is this feeling that everybody hugs each other. I get it, I get it. But unfortunately, you know, as a manager or owner of a business, and as you grow, and if you're listening to this you're probably going to be around 50 employees, okay? You probably are, and I get it. You want everybody to be happy. I want you to be happy too because the bigger you are, the bigger KCAL client you are, and we love you. But the problem is this. Yes, if you become more strict with sexual harassment, people aren't as excited. I get it. But you got to realize every year, between 10 to 30 times a year, I walk into a company and I give the announcement that we are going to close you down. And why does that occur? Many times it's not mismanagement. It's due to a lawsuit. It's due to an employee that has sued the employer for whatever reason, sometimes good, sometimes bad, and the employer has no choice but to essentially let a big part of the company go. Well, in terms of hugging, I've seen cases where hugging has gotten to a point, everybody's hugging, but typically a person that feels harassed, just like I talked about the girl that wanted to wear the trash bag, she didn't say anything to anybody. She didn't say anything. So here I am thinking to myself, why didn't she say anything, right? But a lot of people that feel sexually harassed really don't say anything. And it builds up over time. And one of the issues I constantly see is hugging. Some people are really offended if they get touched. They really are, right? I can tell you my sister, right? I'm a very touchy-feely person. I love hugging people. I love expressing how I feel about somebody else. My sister isn't like that. My sister isn't. She doesn't like to be touched. She doesn't want to be hugged. And is that bad? That's not bad, right? And so you have to understand that there are some people that are very offended by certain things at the office. They're just not telling you. So impeding or blocking movement. All right. So let's just be real. Emery, have you ever had a guy that likes you, right? And you walk and you walk left and he kind of, he jumps. And then you walk over and then he jumps. You're like, what is wrong with this kid, right? Because in your mind, he's no longer a guy. Has that ever happened to you? Yes, unfortunately, yes. And you know, I've seen this so much because in some ways, in some ways, guys are very cute. Why? Because they don't know what to do. So they get nervous. Some guys get mean. Some guys just start acting like they're six years old. And then you walk and then... You know, they, they, they want to be so innocent, and so they, they block you and impede you. Well, there are cases like this, and I think Emery told me it's happened to her about 40 times in her life, where there's blocking of movement constantly occurring. So because of that, I want you to know that has been found to be sexual harassment. Now, what's physical interference with normal work, uh, uh, normal work or movement is that there are some guys particularly in, you know, on, on the cubicle, they go over the cube and they lean over and they say, hey, how you doing? Person's typing away and he's like, hey, wow, you look really good today. Hey, you know, 
geez, you usually wore purple. You wore pink today. Oh, my God. You look so good today, right? And so these things that happen, right, is an interference with normal work. It really, really is. And so because of that, we have to be careful that we have to let everybody know. You know, as I, I, I think I try to intersperse the lecture with some funniness, but the reality is when you think about it on a very serious level, particularly because I have to close so many businesses every year, it's pretty serious and we have to be careful. So other conduct that I've seen is uh, cat calls, right? Like, you know, what you consider to be on the street, you know, walking on the street, some guys like, hey, 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 cat calls, right? Sex tinged or gender specific pranks, practical jokes, right? Maybe a guy at the company, another guy comes and pulls down his shorts. Ha, ah, yeah, it's so funny, right? But you know, that, that could be sexual harassment. We have to be careful. This happens all the time. You know, one time, right? I was, um, so one time I went into a company function and it was like the, you know, the end of the year and suddenly you heard boom, 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 boom. And I was late. I was so tired. I was in the middle of trial and I turned around and they had all of these strippers, but they didn't strip, but they were like dancing. Oh, go, go girls. There were these girls dancing on tables and all I could think about, and you know, obviously the client, he was kind of drunk and he was so happy. But the only thing I could think about is we are going to get sued for sexual harassment. I mean, this is very, very serious. Why? Because my experience is that this occurs a lot. A lot of times employers will say, all guys, we're going to go to Vegas and we're going to go where? Not to the buffet, which is my favorite place, but the strip club. We're going to go to do male bonding. I get it. I get it. But that's very inappropriate. Another thing is to bring clients also to strip clubs, hostess clubs, things of that nature. Those things are inappropriate and extremely dangerous to the work environment. Now, another question that people have is the location of the sexual harassment. And somebody says, if it doesn't occur at work, but it occurs in Vegas because what goes on in Vegas? Stays in Vegas. Not according to Emory, which it wouldn't be a good thing, but I would have to say that there are a lot of people that feel that. A lot of people feel that if it's not in the work environment and if it occurs at dinner, if it occurs when two individual employees are alone, you can't protect that. And I would disagree. And I think the law is on my side. I understand there's some vagueness in the law, but I would definitely say you got to avoid that. So sexual harassment can occur in a hotel room on the East Coast. When you as an employer on the West Coast, it can occur when you're in China, right? And you happen to be a Eastern European con you know, a company. These things occur. So because of that, you have to understand that any employer-sponsored activity or business travel is going to be subject to sexual harassment. Now, what about if sexual harassment, sexual assault, rape occurs? Now, this is something that's very concerning because, again, the analysis would be criminal acts are typically not protected by the employer. The employer is not found liable for criminal acts, but for civil acts, yes. So for civil actions, yes. So a what could happen on a trip is that someone could be raped. That is true, right? Is it a reality? It's a reality of life. But what may end up happening is the employer may not be liable for the criminal action, but definitely for the civil action. And if the harasser is a management employee, the employer will definitely be liable. So um, as Emery was saying earlier, she had learned from another attorney, not me, that the victim need not have been the target, but must have perceived the harassment extremely important. Because again, I want to remind you, I believe that this is an area of litigation that's going to occur, that's going to increase over time. And that is third parties that have witnessed the sexual harassment will begin to sue. There aren't that many cases, but more cases will occur. Why don't we take a couple minutes and then we'll talk about quid pro quo. Thanks. How much more time do we have?